sing I am. Just one more time all over the house. Sing Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Yes. Yes, I love you. How I love you. How I love you. Said I really love you. Thank you for loving me back. Just for who you are. Just when I need him the most, he steps right in and he's right on time. You are the great. You are the great. Said you are the great. You are the great. Said you are the great. Said I. all over the building if you know he's the king of kings you know he's the lord of lords we're just doing what the bible says to do enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise be thankful unto him why because he is the great i am that means if you need him to be that he can be just that what do you need him to be he can be be the one that keeps your family. He can be the one that shields your loved ones. Whatever it is you need. Whatever it is you need. Whatever it is you need. Him. I hold him say in the Bible to Moses, he said, go back and tell Pharaoh, I am that I am. That means whatever you need me to be, I can be a rock in a weary land. I can be the rose of Sharon. Whatever you need. He's that and more. If you believe it and receive it, come on, clap your hands all over the building. He's everything I need him to be. I come to tell you this morning, whatever it is you need from Jesus, he can do it and he can be it. Come on, good morning, Historic First Baptist. Good morning to everyone that is here in person, all of our online viewers. Let's stand all over the building for those that are not standing, and let's worship the Lord together as we make our next declaration. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. Come on, clap your hands all over the building, and let's sing. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood 
coming from the book of Psalms, chapter 84, verse 1 through 12. Excuse me, and it reads, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the shadow builds her nest and raised her young at a place near at your altar. O Lord of heaven's army, my king and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who, make, who have set their minds on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem when they walk through the valley of weeping. It will come to a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will cloth it with blessings they will continue to grow stronger and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem O Lord God of heaven's army hear my pr prayer listen O God of Jacob O God look with favor upon the king O Sh our shield show favor to the one you have anointed a single day in your courts is better than a thousand el anywhere else I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live in a good life in the house of the wicked. For the Lord God is the son of our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing for those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's army, what joy for those who trust in you. That's the, um, sorry, Psalms 84 verse one through 12. New Testament, coming from the big book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1 through 14. Powerful, powerful scripture. And it reads, The old system under the law of Moses always was, was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. 
not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under the system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they never were able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. They could, they could have provided perfect cleansing. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifice would have stopped for the worshipers who had been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually remind them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why the, when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you do not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were, pleased, you were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written in the scripts, for, it is written in, about me in the scripture, excuse me. First Christ said, you do not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He canceled the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was to, for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and the ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again when you can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of the honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering forever made perfect those who have been made holy. That's Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 through 14. His holy scriptures for his holy people. Amen. Anybody know the Lord is great? And he is greatly to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of our God is worthy to be praised, magnified, glorified. He deserves all the glory. All the, do I have any witnesses this morning? He deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. So let's continue to worship him together because he's so deserving of all of our praise. And we want to make our next declaration. He is great and greatly to be praised. Come on, let's worship him. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken great are you lord great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. It's your breath, it's your breath in, our in our lungs. So we pour, so we pour our praise. Pour it's your breath, it's your breath in, our in our lungs. So we pour. We pour Come on, let's sing it again. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour. Come on, stay right there. Let's sing it again. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour. Turn around. It's your breath. In our lungs. So we, so we pour. Come on, let's sing it one more time. Word. It's your bread in our lungs. So we pour. It's your bread in 
about the Savior. We're talking about the ruler. He is the Lord of Lords and he deserves all the glory this morning. One more time. All the earth will, all the earth will shout your praise.
to be praised. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our Father, great are you and greatly to be praised, oh God. There is none other like you, oh Lord. Lord, if I go high, you are there. If I go low, God, you are there. When I fall, Lord, you pick me up, God. You're always there, God. You're so faithful, God. We just said thank you, God. You're so worthy to be praised this morning, God. And we just said thank you, God. God, we stand and we testify, God. We are witnesses to your goodness, God. To your faithfulness, oh God. To your forgiveness, oh God. And we just worship you, God, for who you are, God. We shout hallelujah, God. We said thank you, oh Lord. There is none other like you, God. There is no one that's worthy of the praise like you, oh Lord, God. You are great. You are the great I am, oh God. Hallelujah, Lord. God, I just praise you, God, for your keeping power, God, for your loving power, God. I just praise you, God. I just said thank you, Lord, for keeping us, oh God. You kept our minds, oh God. You gave us a mind to worship and praise you, oh God. We said thank you, Lord. Lord, when the enemy would attack, oh God, you made sure, God, that we were all right. We used them as a footstool, oh God. Thank you, oh God, for your presence, oh God. Thank you, God, for just keeping us, God. Thank you, 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 God. Lord, sometimes the way get hard, but your presence just consumes us, oh God, and let us know that everything is all right, God. God, we just thank you, God. It's in those moments, God, that we truly understand your peace, God, and not the world peace, God. And we can say hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. There is none like you, God. There is none like you, God. Nobody can do me like you, oh Lord. I praise you, God. When I fall, Lord, you pick me up, God. Lord, have mercy, God. When I sin, oh God, you gave us Jesus, God. God, we can come in repentance to you, God. You have made a way, oh God, and we just said thank you, God. And God, we just praise you, God, for this hour of worship. just thanking you for your grace and your mercy God that you extend to us every day God that enables us to stand here not that we've been so good or so right God but you have and we are standing God on the righteousness of our Lord and our Savior hallelujah our Lord and our Savior your son Jesus God Lord, you took our wrong and you made it right, God, in you. And we just said, thank you, God. You're so awesome. You're so full of love. We just said, thank you, God. We just shout hallelujah, Lord. Because we know we're not worthy of God. Thank you, Lord. God, thank you. There is nobody like you, God. We just thank you, God. For just scooping down low and picking us up, God. Seeing us as your child, God. And we just praise you for it, God. For salvation in our Lord and Savior Jesus, God. I, 
I God, I just, I'm just overwhelmed with the love you show us each and every day, God. Your patience, oh God. Your mercy, just new every day, God. We just thank you. God, we pray for those that's just going through right now, God. They, they will look to you, God, knowing that all their help, their strength, God, is in you. You are powerful, God. We pray for those that are bereaved, God. Bless my wife, God, and her family on this morning, God. As our aunt passed on this morning, oh God. But she passed on to eternity, God. And we just praise you, God, for those that die in you, God. They just zapped up from here and right in your presence, oh God. And we praise you for it, God. God, we pray for those among us that are sick, brother, Mr. McKinney. Sister Savage, the manuals, God. Sister Kitty, oh God. God, we just ask your presence, your comfort, God, on those. Those that are caregivers, oh God. We just pray, God. We pray, God, for this church, oh God. That as we grow in you, God, that we become better disciples, oh God. Loving each other, God. Encouraging each other all the more. Each and every day, oh God. And I just thank you on today, God. I pray, God, that you bless the man of God. Fill him with your spirit, oh God. Give him a word for us, oh God, today, God, that we will go higher in you, oh Lord. You are so worthy, oh God. Let the world see you in us, oh God. Let us be transformers, God. Not conformers, oh God, but transformers. Let your light so shine in us, oh God, that the world will see you, oh God, and turn, oh God. We pray for this world, God. We pray for those in political office, oh God. We pray, God, that they will seek your face in everything, oh God. We just thank you today, God. Give you all the glory, and we give you all the praise in that matchless name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Amen and amen. This is the wonderful day the Lord has made. Come on, put your hands together. Let's rejoice and let's be glad in it. Amen. God has been kind to us to give us another Sunday of worship, to give us another opportunity to be a part of the family. And for that, we're grateful. Amen. So we are grateful to our God for this space. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, just lift your hands right where you are if you're in this sanctuary. First time, first time, wonderful. So it's friends and family. If you're worshiping with us for the first time online, I would love for you to drop your information in the chat. Uh, screen is coming up where you can simply scan the QR code and it will take you to a platform that you can fill out more information so that we can continue to welcome you into this space of worship, amen. We're so glad to have you and thankful to God that he brought you our way this morning. Listen, I would love for you to invite family and friends right now into this worship experience. So if you have not shared this celebration with anyone yet, take your devices out and just share via Facebook, via YouTube, via the website. You even online where you are right now in your homes, just share this worship experience or call people from other rooms and say, hey, you need to be in worship with me and let us worship together on today. Amen. We're always grateful when God allows family together, especially on the first day of the week. This being the first Sunday also, I'll go ahead and share with those of you who are virtual. We'll be receiving communion, the Lord's table after the sermon. So. Again, as we prepare to give, as we are giving, you can go and grab those elements and have them close beside you as we worship on today. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's celebrate our God for, again, this time of worship, this time, this time of fellowship. Well, it's time for us to give. Amen? We are always excited when God gives us the opportunity to give. Again, this is for us a responsibility. It is for us a command, but it is also for us a opportunity. 
because a lot because God allows us through our giving to be gifted he also again as we give pours back into us more than we could ever give to him and so we thank God for this opportunity to trust him and that's what giving is it's an opportunity to trust God and so we believe that the Bible teaches us in Exodus chapter 23 15 that we ought not to come before the Lord's presence empty-handed we also believe 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, that the Lord loves what? A cheerful giver. And so we want to give hilariously and lovingly on today. So I want you to grab your offerings. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. Our hospitality ministry is ready to serve you with those envelopes in person. If you're online, we'd love for you to participate in this time of giving with us, whether family, friend, or even visitor. We'd love for you to partner with us in giving, in the giving of tithes and or offerings. And don't forget, First Baptist, on this Sunday, we give above our tithe and above our offering into vision. Amen. So make sure that you are participating equal what? Equal sacrifice, not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. We want to share the load together of what God has called us to do in this season above and beyond our giving of our tithes and our offerings, what we as a church decided to commit ourselves to in the expanding of ministry on this spot of ground and beyond. Amen. So grab your gifts. Everybody has your gifts. Everybody's ready to give. Everybody's ready to give. Lift your gifts with me. Father, thank you so much for every gift and every giver. Thank you now, Lord, for what we will sow into the work of this ministry. We give to you first as we lift our offering saying thank you. And then we place them now preparing to put them in baskets so that, Lord, they can be pressed down, shaken together, and multiply and running over to meet the needs of what you've called this church to fulfill in mission and in vision. And God will be careful to give you praise for how you bless us and how we are able to distribute. This is our prayer. These are your persons who are giving your children, your disciples, continue to again overflow into their lives and we'll be careful to give you praise. All glory indeed belongs to you. This is our prayer. These are your gifts in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Listen, those of you in our side sections who are giving physically, would you stand? Those in our side sections giving physically, would you stand? Coming around from the back to the front, you can give. Those of you online, our mission, our vision, and our giving platforms will be placed back on the screen so that you can participate even now. Morning, gently rest upon my heart. Those in our middle section, would you stand? Middle section, would you stand if you're giving physically? Like the dew in the morning, gently rest upon my heart. Yeah. Like the dew in the morning, gently rest upon my heart. Come on, thank you to every giver for every gift. Put your hands together as our music and worship arts ministry comes back to continue to usher us into the presence of the Lord. I pray that you continue to be participators in worship and not spectators in worship. You can already turn in your Bibles as we prepare to hear the word of God as they come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we are seeking to be better at disciples of Christ in this year, we want to spend some time again afresh around the table. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, that will constitute the framework for our sermonic presentation. So as you turn there or as you open your app to that particular book and chapter, I want you to hold your finger there or put a bookmark there and prepare to hear the word in song before you hear the word spoken. Amen. So come on, put your hands together. Let's welcome our music and worship arts ministry. God is my all and God is Promise 
to keep, promise to keep, never me. to leave, never to leave, never, never, never come short of His word. I've got to fast and pray, stay in the narrow way, keep my and life, keep my life. I want to go when, I want to go when, when he him. comes when back, he comes back, I come to fall, to fall, and let's lift it up, sing go. Testify that there's no one like the Lord. He is, He is, He is our all in all. Whatever you, whatever name you choose to place, whatever need you choose to present, God can, God can provide and God will answer. He is our all, our all, our all in all. Pray for me as, um, we celebrate our music ministry and the gift of them. Um, they always put pressure on me to reduce the lines of my sermon. So pray for me. I was just sharing with the deacons and the pastors as we were praying that I needed to make sure that we are always out on time because we've restarted our time of Christian Academy between services and I need to learn how to preach in a lesser amount of time so if there are two things that need to happen Abner one y'all need to read your Bibles more so you know the sermons I'm going to preach before I preach them and two don't wait to get happy until the end of the sermon get happy throughout the sermon amen and then I'll try to do do less by cutting pages off my sermons amen let's spend some time at the table 1st Corinthians chapter 11 1st Corinthians chapter 11 I want to begin reading at verse 23 1st Corinthians chapter chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, beginning, verse 34, concluding. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to begin reading at verse 23. I want you to hear these words afresh. I know you've heard them before. I know you may think you know them well, but I want you to hear them again as I read from the New Living Translation. For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an argument confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you're really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters. He closes after I arrive. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. Lord, help us to value our time at the table. This is part three, month three the third first Sunday in the year. Do this is the title of this sermon in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. This word remembrance can be defined as a retained mental impression. Simply put, one's memory. This word can also be defined as an act of remembering, a recalling of something, remembrance, something that serves to recall or keep in mind some place, event, or in this case, a person. It is a gift given as a token of love or friendship. It is synonymous with words like recollection, flashback hindsight, retrospect, or even reconstruction. Do this in reminder, in favor, in testimonial of him. You've heard me share this story before, this illustration. It serves best again at this time. Back in the days of the Great Depression, there is a story that is told of a Missouri man named John Griffin. He was the controller of a great railroad drawbridge across the Mississippi River. One day in the summer of 1937, he decided to take his eight-year-old son, Greg, with him to work. At noon, John Griffith put the bridge up to allow ships to pass and sat on the observation deck with his son to eat lunch. Time passed quickly. Suddenly, he was startled by the shrieking of a train whistle in the distance. He quickly looked 
at his watch and noticed that it was 107 and the Memphis Express with 400 passengers on board was roaring towards the raised bridge. John leaping from the observation deck ran back to the control tower but just before throwing the master lever he glanced down for any ships below. There at his glance a sight caught his eye that caused his heart to leap poundingly into his throat. Greg, his son, had slipped from the observation deck and had fallen into the massive gears that operate the bridge. His left leg was caught in the cogs of the two main gears. Desperately, John's mind whirled to devise what would be a rescue plan for his son. But as soon as he thought of a possibility, he knew that there was no way it could be done. Again, with alarming closeness, the train whistle shrieked in the air. He could hear the clicking of the locomotive wheels over the tracks, but that was his son down there. And yet, there were 400 passengers, again, on the switch of the train. John knew what he had to do. So he buried his head in his left arm and pushed down the master switch forward. The great and massive bridge began to lower into place just as the Memphis Express began to roar across the Mississippi River. When John Griffin lifted his head, his face smeared with tears, he looked into the passing windows of the train. There were businessmen casually reading their afternoon papers, finely dressed ladies in the dining car sipping coffee, and children pushing long spoons into their dishes of ice cream. No one had looked at the control house, and no one looked at the great gearbox. With retching agony, John Griffith cried out at the train that could not hear him I sacrifice my son for you people. Don't you even care? The train rushed by, but nobody heard the father's words, which recalled the words of the writer Lamentations, verse one, verse 12 of chapter 1. Is it nothing to you, those who pass by? Search in my estimation, these are the sentiments of the father but yet they are also the sentiments and summation of the writer Paul in his words in verses 17 through 34 as he admonishes this Corinthian church for their lack of intentional and interpersonal action concerning the sharing of the Lord's table. Beloved, these men and women of Corinth, this body of believers, this church, not all, but quite a few were deliberately making trite and trivial in their own prideful ways the celebrating of the Lord's table. So Paul does not just write to those who are the offenders of the table, but he writes to the whole body, the entire church, so that others would not fall into the same behavior of those of these in the past few days. Family, this behavior now being addressed by Paul in our text after being revealed to him in a letter that's written to him by a young lady who's attached to a family of the congregation by the name of Chloe, this revelation or these revelations of hers which the book of Corinthians answers as to their behavior was an affront to the sacrifice of Christ. So Paul says to them that what you are doing when you gather can't even be considered the Lord's Supper. Beloved, Paul submits that they gather and they dine, but communion, the Lord's Supper, is not even what they're participating in. He says all you are doing when you gather weekly for this what has been termed the agape feast, what has been termed the love feast and the celebration of the Lord's Supper is gathering with no power for life application in return. 
view with me the shifts because I need you to understand why Paul makes such an indicting statement. The shifts in our text as he addresses this budding, but yet now we understand broken church. He begins first, if you would travel back with me to the preceding verses, verses 17 through 22. I did not read them, but I will read them now. Because here Paul sets the backdrop of our text for consideration as he addresses what is considered to be their uncommendable fellowship and communion. Hear these words. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you. For it sounds as if more harm than good is being done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper for some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. Paul submits that this is uncommendable fellowship and communion, uncommendable. The meaning gives us this term, not worthy of praise, blameworthy. This word fellowship, meaning communion, as between members of the same church, the gathering persons with similar tastes and interests. Church, Paul begins this discussion on the sharing of the Lord's table as a community of faith by not accentuating the positive, but highlighting their negative. Having just commended them in verse 2 of this same chapter, he now shares with this church in verse 17, but there is this that I cannot celebrate about you. The way you've been gathering around the sacredness of the Lord's table, I cannot give you praise. Paul says, from what I've heard, more harm than good is being done when you meet together. Family, Paul puts forward as the reason for his lack of commendation to this effort, the handling of their table time. He contends that when you meet as a church, it's not for the better, but it's for the opposite. You're bringing out the worst in the family. Beloved, Paul says, from what it sounds like to me, brothers and sisters, when you meet in your places of worship as the gathered church, I have heard that there are divisions among you. He argues that among you where there should be no divisions because of the meaning of the table which lifts the very sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary, the act that should be remembered as it is the consuming act of all divisions in and of this world that makes us one body, there are factions. He then, Paul, immediately after that says this, and I believe it. Church, Paul says, I believe what I've been told, that there are factions, but here's how I believe it, because he further presses this claim by saying there must be factions and divisions so that we might recognize those who are not approved of character. Family, Paul says we must have these fragments because these divisions will prove to be clear distinctions between those who are of the faith and those who are just playing the role of faith. Child of God, you do know that there are people in the church, those who come to the place of worship, who gather in the fellowship, those who worship among us, who play great roles those who gather unaware of the true significance of the sacrifice of Christ. They shout well. They celebrate well. They punctuate all of the right places. But they don't have the right intent or motive for the space of worship. They're on the verge, but always on the peripheral. I hear Jude calling us to chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Hear his words. 
he says, when these people eat with you in your fellowship meals commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the root. They are like wild waves of the sea churning up the foam of their shameless deeds. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to the blackest dark. Church, Paul says to the church at Corinth that what you are doing is not the Lord's Supper because of how flippant you have treated the meaning of the meal, the memory of our Christ, and those who are in attendance that are family. Beloved, Paul reprimands those in the church at Corinth for their hurried eating of the supper which was the love feast, the agape meal, the fellowship meal, which was uh, then eaten before the taking of the Lord's Supper because when they gathered, again, just like on the night when Jesus was betrayed, they ate a meal together and then Jesus takes from that meal and institutes the Lord's Supper. And so not wanting or waiting for those who were in need of the meal the most, them who were the poor, those who were without proper means for feeding themselves, these who were of wealth ate early. But then some of them ate in their presence. Family Paul, in saying this, affirmed that there at a feast where every believer is supposed to be important, and that we should, at the church, never make anybody who's at a feast that's meant to be important feel as they are, though, without significance. Because it's all about Christ, and everybody is important to the Christ. And so we should not take table time to lift our own selves. Historical points, historical points. I need you to understand this. I told you there was a meal that happened before the time of fellowship. It was a part of Roman uh, culture for them to have these prestige meals. And so the people at Corinth were being saved. They're coming out of this culture, and so they come into this culture. They're called class meals. You know what those are, where people who are without wealth are unable to attend. Only those who have social status and wealth and, again, political leadership in the community can attend these particular meals. But again, the church adopts an opportunity for them to have what's our love feast, those feasts that were had even back when the first century church came together. And so they ate together. They brought their own meals to the table and they came to the table to eat. And when they ate, after they ate, they would take communion together. But Paul says to add injury to insult the people who are late to the meal, which are those who are poor, those who still have to work because there was no off day in the Roman culture. When they get to the table, they're already hungry, they're already famished. When they get to the table, those who are at the table are in the inner room, and they have to stay on the outer skirts of the inner room where all of the guests who are invited of prestige are early. They're already reclining, but we have to sit around the walls. They're already eating, and we have to watch them eat. We're hungry, and we're thirsty, and we got to watch them drink. We're on the outside looking in on what should be an opportunity for everybody to sit together. And then to add insult to injury, while we're hungry, you're full. While we're thirsty, you're drunk. And then you want to take the bread of the Lord's table and then take the cup of the Lord's table and you want to lift them and pray for them and then say, this do in remembrance of me. No! Your gathering is in vain because this is what you want me to commend? A selfish act in a selfless place? You don't believe me? I'm in the text because some of you think I'm making this up for a cheap shot. But listen to what Paul says again in verse 22. What? You don't have your homes to eat or drink in? You really don't want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor. What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. 
Beloved, Paul then revisits with them the right intent because after reprimanding them, you have to reset the standard. And so he resets the standard by giving them the historical and theological precedent of the Lord's Supper. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An argument confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Church, Paul presses now in a pause on his rebuke of their behavior. Because he decides now, I need to lift again into your mental reservoirs the ordinance, the fellowship, and the institutional instructions of what the Lord's Supper is. Maybe you've forgotten that this is about Christ. So maybe I need to just relive this moment for you. So he puts on hold his rebuke and he charges them again. Church, what Jesus did and how Jesus did it at the table then is still the standard for receiving at the table now for the fellowship and even for the family of today. Beloved, Paul recounts the instructions of the institution of the Lord's Supper when he says this, as it was handed down to me. I need you to understand that handed down to me not necessarily gives the fact or the implications that he got it directly from the Lord as he was on the Damascus Road. What it suggests is that it's an oral tradition that was by word of mouth handed down to him. And so he takes what is sacred in oral tradition that was handed down to him down the line from the source himself, which is Jesus Christ, and he implements it into the life of this church. He gives the historical reference on the night he was betrayed. Jesus takes bread that represents his body. He offers it, his body as a sacrifice, and he shares that this bread represents my body that will be offered for you. He says, when you take it, don't remember you. Remember me. Beloved, Jesus then would take a cup from the table and give thanks to God, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and humanity, ratified and established in my blood. As often as you drink, and often as we drink, we do it in thoughtful, affectionate remembrance, not of us, but of him. Church, Paul submits that this fellowship at the table is historical and theological in its importance to the church then and now. He did this then, and I do this now so that we might reset the priority of our fellowship around the significance of the Lord's table, which is Jesus. So often we come to the time of communion, and the only thing we think about is us. But the truth of the matter is when you come to the table, the only thing you should think about is him. Beloved, Paul submits to the church at Corinth and to us every time we gather as the church, as the body of believers in this manner, receiving the Lord's Supper, eating the bread and drinking the cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he come. Paul says, when you eat and when you drink, you're preaching. Y'all missed it. Uh, that word proclaiming means that you are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. In that moment, when you lift bread, when you lift cup, you're preaching the gospel to everybody that surrounds you, both saved and unsaved. That's why it's so important for you to remember that it's not about you but that it's about him because when you take the bread, when you take the cup, you are proclaiming the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the soon return of our Christ because the table speaks to now and the not yet. I mean, that's why Paul's admonishment to them and us today is so important because whom, ladies and gentlemen, is sitting around those of who are looking across at us and those who look up to us and those who can be hurt by our 
erroneous preaching at the table from the very wrong receptions at and of the table. Can I tell you, somebody's always watching you. That's why you have to be careful. I'm, 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 uh, you heard me share, share this before. There was, there was this preacher. He was making a wooden trestle to support a climbing vine as he profoundly was pounding away he noticed a little boy that was watching him the youngster was watching him and didn't say a word so the preacher kept on working thinking uh, that the lad would leave but he didn't so uh, pleased at the thought that he was still there the pastor said to him well son I guess you're trying to pick up on some pointers on how to garden how to again build a trestle and the young son looked at him and said no I'm just waiting uh, to hear what a preacher says when, when he hits his thumb with a hammer. There's always somebody watching. Our table time matters. It's not just ritual obedience. We don't come here just to perform a ceremony. It's worship and praise in action to the one and of the one who died in our place for our sins. This selfless act that was committed on our behalf. That's why he says in verses 27 through 32 that you need to be careful to do self-examination. That you need to look at yourself intently read those verses again I'm pressed to make sure we get out of here on time beloved we must be careful in and with our witness church when we get the weighty opportunity of proclaiming of preaching the gospel of our Christ at the table we must always do our best to be worthy of and worthy at the table now let me be clear in and of ourselves we will never be but what makes us worthy is the proper reflection on and remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ that gives us the worth to be worthy receivers. Family, Paul submits that when we eat and drink at the table without right self-examination, hear me, the eliminating of our pride, the eliminating of our arrogance, the eliminating of our prestige, as if we deserve to be sitting here not taking stock of what has been done on our behalf in Christ, we take of the table unworthily. The moment we treat it as a ritual and not a relationship, ladies and gentlemen, then we can be considered as those who are sinning against the body and the blood. Church, before receiving the elements of the table, we must be mindful not to send up what are those quick prayers of flavorful words that others might be impressed with. Lord, forgive me. Make me right in your heart. You know the verse we like that I share all the time, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit that I might be a new creature never really meaning it but only saying it because it sounds right in the moment but we must do right proper self examination we must literally give ourselves what is a spiritual physical as to our relationship with him and to him by allowing the searchlight of his love through his word to get into the closed places of our lives before we receive 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 says this examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine test yourselves surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you if not you have failed the test of genuine faith Paul submits to the church at Corinth and to us to not do to not bring this judgment upon ourselves Church, when we drink without reverence and gratitude that is due the Savior, we drink judgment on ourselves. But let me push it. And I'm done. Because this is what I wanted to get to. All that preaching to get to this one point. Because we skated over this piece. Not only do we need to have a right vertical relationship when we take communion, but we have to have a right horizontal.
horizontal relationship when we take communion. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, that you can take of the table and be right with God and be wrong with men and women and your partaking is sin. Are y'all listening to me? Ladies and gentlemen, if you come to the table and have treated wrong your brother or your sister and you take, you can take in sin. I, all right. Go back to verse 20, 21, 22. Y'all think I'm making it up. When you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal and without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Do you have your own homes? Don't you do? For eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. So the unworthiness of the table is not just based on your own internal worship and relationship but also your external actions and fellowship with other believers. It's not just vertical, it's horizontal that's called to task at the table. The very act of the table is selfless. It is self-giving. And to come to the table and be selfish and self-serving is an affront to God and a disgrace to the gift of Jesus. So the question is, how can you take from the table that was so freely given to you and at the same time withhold from those whom he has welcomed to his table that you are not over but a part of? Which means, ladies and gentlemen, how can we eat at the Lord's table and watch others around us go hungry? How can we come and celebrate the gift of a substantial Christ and not provide sustenance and substance for those who are around us? How can you say you love me in whom you have not seen and dislike and hate your brother in whom you see or your sister every day? If you have aught with a brother or sister, you're to leave your offering at the altar and go and reconcile before you give it because it's dishonored if you place it in the tray and you have tension in your heart. Well, it's the same thing with communion, ladies and gentlemen. If you have tension with somebody in your heart and you take it up the table, how can you, at a place of forgiveness, have unforgiveness? I'm done. So then he tells them, here's what commendable fellowships look like. So my dear brothers and sisters, verse 33 and 34, when you gather at the Lord's table for the Lord's supper, here's what you need to do. Wait on each other. If you're really hungry, eat at your house. Eat at home so you don't bring drugs upon yourselves when you meet together. And then he says, you know what? There's some other stuff that's going down but it ain't even worth talking about right now. This is the most important thing. So we'll talk about that other stuff when I get there. Are y'all listening to me? He said, I'm writing about this because this is more important than anything else I want to say right now. Because I need you to know that if you don't get this right, there's a good chance that you're putting yourself in a position where you and God will be at odds. And how oxymoronic is it for you to have done all the work of confessing and believing and worshiping and participating only for your offering to be dismissed he says I want you to have commendable fellowship and communion so when you gather I need you to think about this moment selflessly I need you to come to the table thinking about your examination between you and God but your examination between you and your brother. Which means even today before we take of the table, if there is aught in your heart for anybody, I need you to either go to them if they're in the sanctuary, text them or tweet them before you partake of the table. Because I don't want you to partake of the table unworthily. Because he submits that, listen, I need you to examine yourself because some of you have been taken of the table. And because of this, you've been judged in such a way 
that some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you have even died because of how you have treated the table. And this is a literal statement, not a figurative statement. And so he submits that the table is just that important. Warren Wiersbe closes with these words of my illustration. The Lord's Supper is a family meal. And the Lord of the family desires that his children love one another and care for one another. It is possible for a true Christian to get closer to his Lord while at the same time he is separated from his fellow believers. But how can we remember the Lord's death and not love one another? He says, don't make the mistake of coming to the table being unworthy. Yeah. It's a shame that you got your yeah. sung all those songs, heard those prayers, even heard this message, and I will get down to the table and we'll begin to partake and all of that great worship is undone because you have a broken horizontal relationship. Because there's somebody you have not forgiven. Because there's somebody you're holding a grudge against. Some spouse, some child, some friend, some coworker, some neighbor, some ex, ex whatever. Here you are at the table saying, Lord, bless me. And you're partaking, yet still getting sicker. And you wonder why. Still hurting over a relationship that should have been mended, that you've been telling the Lord to mend. But it's eating you away inside. It's making you bitter because you've been talking to the Lord, but not talking to the person. Here we are. As we prepare to receive the thing, we need to have right thoughts, right mind, right spirit. So as I as I as I prepare to pray for those who are not saved, we want everybody to be in right relationship and salvation. But then as we pray, then we also want people to be in right fellowship and assimilation. And then we'll pray over those who are wrestling and struggling. And then we'll prepare to take from the table. But all the while I'm doing this, I need you to do like I've been trying to do all week long. Remember to make sure before I get to the table that I've been just as forgiving of others as I wanted God to be forgiving of me. I've been just as kind to others as I've wanted God to be kind to me. I've been just as receptive to others as I've wanted God to be receptive to me. I've extended a hand as much to others as I've wanted God to extend his hand to me. And I've been wrestling all week asking the Lord to forgive me and trying to think of those I need forgiving from and need to forgive. Because some folk don't even know you mad at them. Father, thank you for this, this time of worship, this time at the table. God, we, we pray that in our reflection today, in this presentation of your word today that hearts have been rightly challenged as the word has been responsibly divided so that Lord we can be better at being your disciples even now as we come to the table but even before we get to the table every day we live we want to live our lives on purpose as our actions and our activity proclaims and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. So even now, Lord, we pray for that brother or sister who's not saved. We pray.
pray that they receive salvation today. We pray for that brother or sister who's saved, that today they reassimilate themselves into the fellowship, the fold, and the family. And Lord, we thank you for even now just this time that you give us to remember you. Lord, our eyes are watching you. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Listen, the door to our Father's house is open. If you're not saved, you need to be saved. If you're saved, you need to belong somewhere. We want you to come. We want you to be a part of this family, this fellowship. We want you to connect with other believers in such a way that you can be, again, a part of this wonderful body, this family we call church, this space that we call Historic First Baptist. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have you. If you're in, in the virtual space, even if you're in the sanctuary as well, and you desire to connect with us, partner with us, information is being placed on the screen so that you can connect with us even on today. You can simply scan that QR code. It'll, again, take you to a space where you can provide information for us, and we'll contact you as soon, as soon as we can get that information within the next 24 to 48 hours for sure so that we can continue to extend the offer of Christ to you as well as we continue to, to welcome you into the life of this fellowship. Again, my brother, my sister, you can come at this time. As we offer Christ to you, oh, my brother, we offer Christ to you. Oh, my sister, he will give you brand new life, give you life abundantly, so come, come on, come on to Christ. Come on to Christ. Come on, put your hands together. We celebrate the gift of our God, the gift of the person of Christ, and we thank God always for the opportunity to connect with the family of faith. We thank God for those who made decisions today, whether it was to join the fellowship, whether it was to receive Christ, or whether it was to allow us to pray with and pray for you. I want to invite everyone now to grab your communion elements as we prepare to receive uh, from the Lord's table. Those of you who are virtual, I want to invite you right now to grab those elements as we prepare to partake together at the table. Oh, the blood of did we know that the sermon would come true so quickly and some of you are having trouble opening your elements and what we're going to do is wait on you because we don't want to receive from the table unworthily you need another one bless your heart bless your heart Deacon McKee bless your heart bless your heart it's okay it's okay this is Amen. Amen. 
Anyone else having trouble? Everybody's good? Sometimes, again, as you know, back in the day, we had the crackers and the wafers and trays, and you could just reach your hand in there. There was not the trouble of plastic. And you had the cups, and so there was not the trouble of opening. And so we understand that we have to leave room for those to give time to open them up because they are, they are difficult sometimes. And so we don't fault or hold that against, that against, that against. And we want to wait anyway so that we can take worthy together. Amen. Amen. Everybody with elements in hand, do we remember, we reflect over the past first Sundays as I've been trying to preach each passage of scripture that deals with the moment of communion so that we could be better at being disciples. That as we receive from the table, we receive from a table that was already spread with elements, unleavened bread, bitter herb, but not a lamb because Jesus was the lamb to be slain. And so at that moment, Jesus takes bread from the table. And as he lifts the bread, he lifts it towards God. He blesses it and he breaks from that one loaf. And then he passes it around and they all break from the same loaf. And he shares, this is my body that will be given for you. As often as you do it, you ought to do it, what? In remembrance of me. Father, thank you for this opportunity to remember. Thank you for this opportunity to reflect. We center our thoughts on you. And Lord, we pray that even after we've done self-examination with you, that Lord, we've also done self-examination in our relationships horizontally. And Lord, not only are we asking for your forgiveness, we are forgiving those who we've held grudges against. We're asking you, Lord, to bless those who, Lord, we've had ought with. And then, Lord, even as we take of the table and leave this place, as you have reminded us of our moment at the table, let us leave this place reaching out to those that we have broken fellowship with. And, Lord, help us either to mend those relationships or end those relationships rightly. And, God, we'll be careful to give you praise. All glory indeed belongs to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. Then taking the cup from the table, he lifts the cup. He blesses the cup. He says, this is now the blood of my new covenant that will be shed for you as often as you drink of this cup. You drink this cup in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. And we pray God's blessings over each and every life. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate our God together. Let's thank him for, again, this opportunity he's given us to be family in this space. Amen? Amen. Listen, we're getting ready to leave this place uh, quickly because our Christian education needs to be in, in this space very soon. I did an almost good job, an almost good job, an almost good job of making sure I was close to the time I wanted to get to, but I didn't do a great job. And so I'll do a better job in the coming days as we try to work through this. But sometimes passages are so heavy, I want to make sure I explain it best so that we don't leave here uh, with wrong thoughts or wrong teaching. Amen. Our heart is always to make sure that we are strong for the journey. How many of you have been, again, discipling people? Remember, one a month. How many of you have been sharing Christ and then allowing, discipleship is what? Allowing people to walk with you as you're walking. How many of you have been taking up the mantle? Right, so some of y'all don't want to be better at being disciples. That's cool. I just need to know who the disciples are and who the disciples are not. Amen, that's cool. I, I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying the mantle is, our goal is, to reach one person a month with the gospel, right? And then let that person walk with us this year. Amen? So that, again, we can be better at what being a disciple really means, and that is what a reproducer of Christ in others. Amen? Don't forget Christian education is immediately following. Our academy is happening right after worship for all ages 
um, uh, lessons for this month is speak life over someone. Don't forget this weekend, this weekend is our uh, state conventions at the Grafton League at Greater St. Luke. It'll be at Greater St. Luke on this Saturday from 9 until 1230. There are classes that are available. I know I'll be teaching uh, the pastoral leadership class for the Western half of the state, Navigating Change and Renewal in Ministry. There's also a class on Empowering Lay Leaders, which is Cultivating Faithful Engagement and Transformational Communities. We also have a class, Ms. Tawana Millard is going to be teaching um, healing and restoration, trauma-informed care in Christian, uh, um, what is it, Christian resources or Christian spaces. Uh, Y'all know my class, Christian ministries, you know I have to let my eyes get uh, focused, right? Uh, I'm learning, getting older, boy, I can't even read this far. I used to be able to see and see far. Amen. Maybe it's just a little writing. Okay, and then you got leadership, ethical leadership, and social justice and Christian education. And then you got technology, innovative teaching, uh, methods for faith and formation. So these are the classes that are being taught. You can take those classes on this coming Saturday. Again, registration. You have to register for classes. You can't just show up. Registration ends tomorrow. It ends tomorrow. You can't just show up. Amen. Also, our WT Webb Leadership School is going into its second session. And Dr. Chapman, uh, again, desires for every member, every friend, you want to take a class in this next session. Uh, we have church. I'll be teaching that, which is an evangelism class. Again, how to reach those who are in this present context. Uh, computers in the life of the church, Ms. Annie Teague, and Articles of Faith and Baptist Covenant, Dr. Felicia Lavad. If you are a member of the Baptist Church and you've never heard of the Articles of Faith or the Baptist Covenant, shame on you. You need to take this class because our church operates, the church operates by the Articles of Faith and the covenant that has been listed, right? Again, there are some adjustments, and we'll talk about we'll talk about those. But this is from the African American church's perspective, because there are two different renderings of that communication. All right, there's one for the entire church, but the interpretation of the entire church rendering has been diluted in some spaces, and so you want to take that class. All right. Also, don't forget this week, Bible study at noon as well as at 6.30, our lunch and learn. We're looking forward to that time together. And then midweek Bible study at 6.30 p.m., our Children's Discipleship Academy and our Discipleship University for our youth is happening. Our instructors are here. Can I say that? Our instructors are here for our children and youth, but they need your children to instruct. And so we will ask you to carve out that hour to make sure your children are here so that, again, they can have a, uh, a wealth of information to be discipled just like you, right? Then also next week, don't, don't, don't miss this, next week is sabbatical week. I instituted this last year. When the church has gone through heavy weeks of ministry, we try to institute what's called a sabbatical week where we're out of the office and we just take time to breathe as a church. That'll be next week, but we'll just breathe, all right? Uh, from December until this week, the church, the church's staff, which includes members and leaders, have been running. And we want to take a week to breathe so that we don't burn out, overwhelm ourselves, overheat, uh, and treat each other wrongly uh, in these settings, amen? So we want to make sure we take weeks where we just breathe together. And then don't forget this, this month, our third Wednesday fellowship for our seniors. Again, all seniors, 62 and over. Uh, that includes you, Abner, 62 and older. You need to be at the senior fellowships on Wednesdays, on Wednesdays, the third Wednesdays, because Abner tried to act like he's under 60. And uh, I, I try to tell him, if you're a senior, just be, uh, take advantage. You want the senior discounts when you go to the store, take advantage of the senior fellowships. Amen. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Only him I can mess with. Daylight savings time starts when? Next Sunday. So you'll have an hour ahead. They hadn't changed it yet. They hadn't voted on it. You still got to go an hour ahead, right? So some of y'all will be early to church. All right. So y'all so messy. Y'all think I'm talking about people. I'm just telling y'all daylight savings time. All right. 
Don't forget the 25th through the 29th is Holy Week, Holy Week, because Resurrection Sunday is what Sunday? Easter Sunday is what Sunday? The 31st. There are five Sundays in this month. Easter comes early. And so the week before, we'll do Palm Sunday, and then Holy Week services, they'll be held at the Macedonia Baptist Church, so more information will be, be coming on that. Birthdays this week, would you stand? I know Miss Kim Hicks, your birthday is tomorrow. Amen. Come on. Abner. Yep, Abner's birthday is this week. So we celebrate their birthdays. Amen. We know y'all are going to get great gifts. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate them one more time. Amen. 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 Kevin looking like he's already, uh, he, look, he's, he's, he's like, I got to, you know, that's the, that's, the, that's the cost cutter right there. So he's looking like, hey, we're going to spend it all. <laughs> no, we're going to celebrate everybody this week. Don't forget also Michael Moore, Jacqueline Davis, Lynetta Dickerson, Jeffrey Hannah Huff this week, Taronda Merriweather, Jackie Rivers, Christopher Folks, and Terrence Dawson's birthday is this week. Amen. So when you see them, when you talk to them, let's celebrate them. Amen. Amen. Wedding anniversaries. Anybody celebrating a wedding anniversary this week? Anybody celebrating a single anniversary this week? <laughs> Y'all a mess. Y'all a mess. Y'all a mess. Come on, let's stand. I'm trying to get all that all out of you so you can get it. Amen. Sister Hart said this uh, after, and I'm, I'm sorry, Sister Hart. She knew, uh, she knew I was going to say it, but Sister Hart came up to me and asked me this question. She said, Pastor, she says, are you a middle child? And, you know, I'm trying to figure out what that means. You know, so she said, Pastor, you're a middle child. I said, yes, I'm a middle child. She said, yes. He said, it's those middle children that we have to pray for hard. And I was just, I just trying to figure out why. She said, because you never know what they're going to say. So you have to pray for them that, that you know, the Lord covers their, their mind and their tongue because they just say anything. And I said, that ain't me. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy. Let's get out of here because you know. how many of y'all excited? LeBron got forty thousand. All right. So, April first Sunday when y'all come to the table, um, I don't want y'all to take the table wrongly. So go ahead and let that go. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to smile upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the countenance of his presence, his face upon you, and give you his peace in your laughter and in your leisure, in your frustration and even in your tears, until we shall all one day sit at the feet of Jesus where there is no sunrise or sunset. God bless you. I love you. Y'all have a great week. I'll see you on Wednesday. Amen. Listen, make sure... Y'all prepare yourselves. We're getting ready for Sunday school immediately. Amen. We're about eight minutes late.